Today's scripture comes from 1 Kings, chapter 3, and we're going to also look at from chapter 11. So that's found in uh, page uh, 351 in your pew Bibles. So uh, we'll uh, keep your Bible open and I'll uh, read as I uh, go through the passage as I, as I uh, share the message. If you're visiting, uh, we are going through a series called The Story. The Bible is the stories of the Bible. And uh, today we have the story uh, of Solomon. So if you haven't here last uh, couple months, you know that we're going through from Genesis and we're now in 1 Kings. And so this story of Solomon is a pretty familiar story for many, uh, many of us. Uh, but let me ask you, uh, what, is, what is Solomon known for in the Bible? Just uh, hold on. Wisdom. Okay, so I thought that would be the first one. <laughs> He's the wisest man on earth, right? So wisdom. What else? What is it? Wealth. Wealth, that's right. So, uh, wealth. Uh, I did a quick a Google search to see how rich uh, Solomon was, and I, there were just so... A lot of different pages, uh, which I was interested, you know, it was pretty interesting. And this is what I found. Top 10 richest people of all time in history. And Money Magazine and there are other, just a few different websites. Uh, I don't know how accurate they are, but, you know, it's from the internet. Um, uh, so top 10, and this man you know, we recognize, right? Who's this? Bill Gates. Right, Bill Gates. And he didn't make it to top 10. He's uh, currently the most rich, richest person in the world today. And uh, in one uh, website, he was he ranked 19, right? And he acquired or uh, wealth is $144 billion. Here's the next one. Guess who this is? Henry Ford. All right. So this is Henry Ford, that's right. Uh, he made it uh, number eight, and so I'm going to just show you a few Americans that <laughs> you may recognize. And uh, 199. So next one, guess who this is? Carnegie. Yeah, Carnegie. That's right. Uh, he ranked number four, 310 billion dollars. That's a lot of money. Uh, and this one. You already, somebody said that. Yeah, Rockefeller, right? John Rockefeller. Number two, and at uh, $663.4 billion. And then, drum roll, number one, yeah, King Solomon. And just way, it's not in billions, like $2.1 trillion. They had their way of calculating, so, you know, we'll just uh, trust that, you know. Those are, and they had a couple other websites which had a couple other people, but a lot of money. And somebody calculated that Solomon, if he were paid uh, annual pay, he would be paid every year $760 million each year. So there's, that's a lot of wealth. Okay, what else do you know about Solomon? Wives. What is it? Wives. Wives. That's right. How many wives did he have? Yeah, we'll read about that a lot. <laughs> what else? What is it? I can't hear you. Tabernacle. Tabernacle, that's right. He built a temple right in Jerusalem, which is pretty um, yeah, spectacular. What else? He was also a learned man. If he had PhDs uh, today, he would have PhDs from Harvard, Yale, all the Ivy League schools in politics, in business, in family counseling sexuality, uh, economics, those are all the um, topics that's covered in the book of Proverbs, which he wrote. So now, who wants to be like Solomon? Be honest, we're in church. Yeah, okay, a couple hands. Maybe some of you men are thinking, thousand wives, I cannot even handle one. No way. <laughs> All right, this morning, I want to dig into two chapters in, uh, in 1 Kings, where it covers the story of Solomon in chapter 3 and chapter 11. And I want to specifically show you two things. One, 
Uh, how, how did Solomon really flourish in his life with such wisdom, wealth, as we talked about, honor and power, and became a really successful king? And then second, what made Solomon's downfall? Right? So first, what made Solomon flourish as a great and wise king? In chapter 3, we read about how Solomon receives uh, from God this great wisdom and the promise to give him not only wisdom but wealth and honor. And as I read this, and as we'll take a look together, I found it very interesting that Solomon never really prayed for wisdom. You know, he was like earnestly seeking God, God give me wisdom. Actually, and that's an important thing to note because uh, that gives us a clue about who God is and uh, what God does with His people. In verse 4, uh, if you look at verse 4, um, why, don't, why don't we take a look from, from uh, verse 1. So, verse 1, uh, chapter 3, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh king of Egypt and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished buildings, building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing to the high places because the temple had not been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of the father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. And verse 4, the king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices for, that was the most high, important place, high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. Let's stop for a moment. So, Solomon uh, gave this thousand uh, burnt offerings. And again, in this verse, or in this text, it doesn't say that Solomon did that, worship God, uh, in order to get something, or in order to ask for wisdom, or wealth, and honor, or, or anything like that. In verse 5, then, we read, At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want, you, you want me to give you. Stop there. God showed up to Solomon because he wanted to show up. He just appeared in a dream. Why? Because I find this uh, important clue in verse 3. And if you go back to uh, verse 3, it will be on the screen. Yeah, okay, let's read that together. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him. His this tells us one thing, that Solomon's relationship with God, if God was here and Solomon here, it wasn't like far, but it was like this. There was an intimate, close, personal, loving relationship. Solomon showed his love for the Lord, the Bible says. And I imagine Solomon growing up with his father, King David, and how King David was, as the Bible says, a man after God's own heart. Solomon saw his father every day fully devoted to the Lord, and how he followed the Lord completely. And this shows in this text how that is showing in, in what we read in, in, in this in this chapter. So here's how Solomon answers to God's question. Solomon asked whatever uh, you want me to, uh, to give you. So in verse 6, 6 to uh, 8, let me read that now, and we can see how, again, uh, his love for God was. In verse 6, Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him, and have given him a son to sit on this, his throne this very day. 
Verse 7, Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, to numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart. So this is what he asks, discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? It's not there. So in, this, in these verses, we can see when Solomon answers to God to his question, how Solomon knows who God is and how much he loves God with awe and fear. In verse 6, it says, You have shown this great kindness to your servant, your father David. He recognizes how God is so generous, extravagant in, in love and in kindness. He continues, You have continued this great kindness to him and given him a son to sit on the throne. You have made your servant king. Give me a discerning heart to govern your people. He recognizes that these good things comes from God and he has seen it in his lifetime through his father and through his father's work as a king. But he also recognizes uh, his weakness and he, he in humility cries out to God. He says, I'm only a little child. Now, and I do not know a thing to, to be a king. So he begs God for a discerning heart. He asks, as a little child cries, cries out to his father, Solomon cries out to God in total dependence on God. And God, I need you. I need you to help me to have this discerning heart. And then God's response in verse 10, 10 through 13, take a look. This is how God responds. The Lord was pleased. That's why the Bible says first. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. Verse 11. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth or for, for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice. I will do what you, what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. So when our relationship with God is in the right place, when our hearts are turned toward God in love, when we are keeping this covenant of intimate, loving, and personal relationship with God, we can see here it is not hard for God to pour out His blessing on His people. Beyond what we ask or imagine. That's what God loves to do. He's a, such a generous giver. And that's what we see here in Solomon's story. And there are, from chapter 3 to chapter 10, there are a num number of ways how God has answered His prayer, His ask, but how God has given really more than what He asked, both wealth and wisdom and honor. There's one place, this is how specifically God uh, delivered on His promise. In uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 29 uh, to 30 and 34, this is uh, what the Bible says. And God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight, and a breath of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom 
sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Wow. Just imagine that. People just coming from all over the world. Imagine if people are even, you know, coming from this town to listen to you, <laughs> to listen to your wisdom. But the kings of the world during that time heard about Solomon and his wisdom, and they are coming in droves to, to hear him and to inquire him, to sit under him. So, so what, again, what made Solomon's life to flourish like this in such wisdom and honor and wealth? Again, it's simple and profound. Back to verse 3. This is the key. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David. It would have been great and wonderful if this is the end of the story for Solomon's life. But there's more to the story. So secondly now, the sad part of the story, the downfall, of Solomon's life. It is a shock to turn to chapter 11 of 1 Kings and to read about Solomon's downfall. It is awful to hear how a man was such a wise person, such a godly person that we just saw. The man who loved the Lord, who had such intimate relationship with God, that God was so pleased just to hear him and to see him and showed up in a way that's amazing. How a man like that can stray from God, so far from God. So if you would turn with me to uh, chapter 11, that's on page 363. You know, we'll, we'll take a look at how, how that happened, but think for a moment. When I think of Solomon and what was happening, just like people coming from all over the world, to hear him, to hear his wisdom. What an opportunity, what an audience he had to actually to testify about his God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, that God, this God is the only God, only true God. God gave Solomon everything that any human being can imagine or want to have or dream to have in our life to what? In order to glorify God, right? That's the chief end of men, as the, one of the catechism, Westminster Catechism says. What an opportunity to really give glory to God with such blessings, with such, so much things that God has given him. And he had an opportunity to do that, to not only govern his people, but also to, to uh, show that to the rest of the world. But we read, however, Solomon used all that good stuff in his life to glorify himself and not give glory to God. There's no record in the Bible, in, in this chapters of 1 Kings, that says anything about, wow, people were coming and hearing Solomon's wisdom and, and they glorify God, Yahweh, the God of Israel. There are a few things that contributed to Solomon's downfall, but let me focus just on one major one that we read in this chapter, in chapter 11. So, let me read the first three verses in chapter 11. Verse 1, King Solomon, however, I mean up to chapter 10, it's all about you know, greatness of Solomon. And chapter 11, the writer says that King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughters, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your heart after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. That verse in, in the message translation says, Solomon fell in love with them anyway, refusing to give them up. So it was hard for him to just 
refuse what God says, don't do it. And, and it says that, and, and, and then that how many uh, wives that Solomon had? Right here in verse 3. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him what? Astray. So we see the what what contributed to, to his fall. And I find the next verse very instructive. In verse 4, it says, As Solomon grew old, time goes on. Things like this happening. His wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the, as the heart of David his father had been. Thousand wives. What, why, do you, why do you think that Solomon ended up <laughs> with a thousand wives? Was he a womanizer, a playboy? Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. But some of the Bible commentators say that during those times, uh, having wives was part of a seal of international relations. <laughs> And this is what the nations have done, the kingdom, small and large. So that's the, the common practice in, in the ancient Near East at that time. Solomon, without a doubt, knew that marrying pagan wives were forbidden for the Israelites, as recorded in Deuteronomy and Exodus, and as we read here again in 1 Kings. So then we got to ask, why then? This wise person, this godly person, the king of Israel, still do this. Well, I can only guess that he did what we all do, all the time, as sinful human beings. We make excuses and make rational, rationalize our sin. And he's probably thinking, well, this is going to make our country great. It's what every other nation is doing. And he's saying, no one is thinking that um, this is wrong, etc., etc. There must be other excuses that he was making in his mind. And as we know, when we sin, small things, one thing leads to another and to bigger things. And as James 1, 14, 15 says this in the Bible, we have it in the screen. It says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Verse 15, then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. I love how Eugene Peterson translates the same verse as we think about situation in Solomon's life. And it's how, this is how uh, the message has it. The temptation to give in to evil comes from us and only us. And James says this to say that we cannot blame God is tempting us or it's from Satan. It's the temptation to give in to evil comes from us and only us. We have no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare-up of our own lust. Lust gets pregnant and has a baby. Sin. Sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. This is precisely what is happening to Solomon's life. He has temptations to disobey God's word. His heart is divided between this women of his life and his God. His lust, he lusts more and more and he listens and loves his wives more and more. And they ask Solomon to do things for them, many things, but as we read here, like building shrines, temples to worship these foreign gods, that God doesn't like Israelites to do. And slowly, but surely, and over a stretch of time, 
Solomon's heart is turned away little by little. And he moves farther and farther from God until his heart is turned away altogether from his God. Then we read on in this text how Solomon moves on to openly defy God and publicly sin against his God. In verse 5, we read, He followed Estoreth, the god, goddess of the Sidonians, and Mo, the Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Verse 6, So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives. So that's what he ended up doing. Thousand wives. He built these temples to worship his foreign gods who burn incense and offer sacrifice to their gods. So let me ask you, by this time, when this was all happening, do you think that he is still a wise person? That wise king, who had audience from people, probably wise people from all over the world? I don't think so. I don't think so, because what the Bible says about the wisdom, and here's what the Bible says, just a few verses. And actually this is part of what Solomon wrote <laughs> in Proverbs. This one, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. And let's, can we read this together? Begin. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. A fool despise wisdom and instruction. Another verse from chapter 3 uh, of Proverbs, uh, verse 7. Women, ladies, can you read this together? Begin. Let's look at another verse from Job chapter 28, 28. And all the men, let's read together. And he said to the human race, The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is So what's, what's one phrase that's repeated to define what wisdom is according to the Bible? What is it? That's right, the fear of the Lord. That is the wisdom according to the Bible. Solomon's actions in chapter 11 that we just looked at show us clearly that there is no fear left, fear of the Lord left in his heart. Because if he did have any fear of the Lord, this all reverence before God, respect for God, he would not have done all of this stuff that we're reading that's forbidden by God. And here's the result. Verse 9. Result of all of that, what Solomon did. The Lord became what? The Lord became angry with Solomon. And contrast that to what we just read in chapter 3, right? What did, what did he say? The response to Solomon was, God was so pleased, delighted. But now, the Lord became angry with Solomon because why? Because his heart had turned away from the Lord. His heart was turned away from the Lord. The God of Israel had appeared to him. We, we sang this morning the first song, God, come, now is the time to worship. And what, what did we sing? Give you your heart. We are here to worship God and we when we show up here, God is so pleased because that is an act that we are turning our heart toward God. And we sing these songs. These are, you know, in many ways, songs of love, adoration, to say, God, we sing for you because your love is so great and we will respond in this way. And then, like what we read in chapter 3, God is so pleased. But here, God is angry with Solomon because his heart 
is turned away. Next verse says, the Lord, uh, verse 10, although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. Next verse, so the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear, tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Next verse. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. God is angry here, but we can see God's mercy still. God is compassionate still to Solomon. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. But again, yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from you, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So that's the, fall, the rise and the fall, the glory and the shame of Solomon's life. Now lastly, let's consider one more question, and that's this question. Who is the God that we discover or encounter in this story of Solomon? Through this story that we just Consider together, who, who, what kind of God do we discover? This is the story of Solomon, yeah, for sure. But before that, actually, bigger than that, this is God's story, right? The story that we are reading through, are we read about David and Solomon, and we'll read more about the kings and other characters in the, in the Old Testament and New Testament. But this is God's story. And Solomon shows up as part of God's story. So the question, who is the main character of this book, of Solomon's story? Briefly, just three things that I note, I just want to note, that I, I discover as I uh, reflected on this. First, the God as the abundant and generous giver. All right, we saw that in chapter 3, right? This God, we see this God who gives, who wants to give, who loves to give far more than our asking and wishes when He's pleased and He's delighted to His people. God gave Solomon so much more than what he asked or deserves. But that's who God is. God wants to give and give and give. Second, we see a God who is patient. This is what we just read in, in chapter 11. Solomon was turning away from God over time through his disobedience to God, right? Little by little. But God did not condemn or destroy him right away. He's patient by lovingly waiting for him to give chances. Second chance. Third chance, ten chances, hundred chances. God is patiently waiting for him to turn around to him. Third, we see a God who is faithful in keeping his promises. Solomon, as we saw, had completely turned away from God, publicly defied God and sinned against God as a king of Israel by worshiping idols with his pagan wives. God could have just wiped the whole thing out. God could have just end the whole thing right there and destroy him for good. But the Bible says out of respect, out of honor for David, his father, God showed mercy to Solomon because he promised his father David. And he says, I'm not going to tear the whole kingdom in your lifetime. So he waits until he dies. And then he's not taking the whole kingdom, kingdoms from, tribes from, from him, but gives one of the tribes to his son, which becomes the line of David, King David, and eventually the line of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so what? How, how does this story actually then 
becomes our story, the God story. And how do we find ourselves in this story of God, in the story of Solomon? Let me just ask you this, uh, this final question as, as a question of application, perhaps. And it's this simple question. Where are you in your relationship with God today? There are probably other ways that we can apply this story, but here's one way. I see the relationship of Solomon with God as the central to this story. And actually, God doesn't care about how much wealth we have, or how much we are respected by kings of the other, other nations. God was concerned about his heart, how he relates to God how he is walking according to the covenant that God has made with him and the Israelites made with his, their God. So this relationship thing, where, where are you today? Where, where is that relationship? Your personal, not your father's relationship, not your mother's, not your grandparents, your relationship today with God. Today, in just a moment, we're going to celebrate communion together. The first one of this year. And I would like to invite you to reflect and consider this question. Just a simple question. Where, where's my relationship with God today? Maybe some of you do feel that close, intimate, personal, loving relationship with God. There's nothing, no wall between you and God. Maybe some of you may feel maybe you have one leg in God and you have another leg in something else. Maybe there's something between you and God, something that gets in the way of that intimate loving relationship. Maybe some of you say, there's no God in my life today. You saw you feel, I, I feel so far away from God. There's nothing. I don't think about God every day. I don't think about God when I wake up, when I go to work. Maybe then for you, you need a brand new, fresh start in the relationship with God. And this is a great time. The first Sunday of the year, we're all in church. No matter where you are in your relationship with God, let me tell you this. You are, every one of you and me, you are, we are in the right place today. We are in a house of worship to our living God. And I don't know, perhaps there's a reason why we're all here. Consider it in listening again to the story of Solomon and how he lived, how he flourished and how he was destroyed. How his glory in his full life was shown in and how he fell so far in his sin. And I want you to know that the God that met Solomon, the God who showed up, in Solomon's life, it's the same God who wants to show up in your life and my life today, in this new year of 2019. So here's my prayer for all of us, that we would meet this God first, this generous God, this God who wants to give and give and give far more than we can ever imagine. This patient God who's waiting for us to turn our hearts fully to the Lord. And this promise keep, keeper God who will fulfill, will deliver on all the good promises that God has made for those who are in Jesus Christ, for those who love Him. And that God has shown up in this very act, sacrament that we celebrate today. 
the God who gave everything, the God who is still waiting for us to turn, to see and fix our eyes on, the God who will, who is the ultimate fulfillment of all the promises that we can ever imagine and wait for. So let's meet God today in the sacrament, but let's pray that God will lead us throughout this year. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence among us. We thank you for your promise that where two or three gather in your name, that you are there. We thank you for meeting us here today in this worship. We thank you for the story that helps us to reflect and think about our own life, especially our relationship with you. Lord, we pray that you would help us today and throughout this year to create a space for you in our life, in our hearts, and to receive you as our God, our Lord, our giver, our patient, loving Father who is waiting for us. And thank you for all your promises, the promises that you said you will love us no matter what. The promise to be with us always to the end of the age because you have such love, you have such kindness and mercy and grace toward us. So Lord, we thank you and we bless your name. And may we do that, not only today, but throughout this new year. And we thank you and pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.